Miracles have occurred throughout history, but are there supernatural answers for the emotional, financial, physical, and spiritual needs we face today? Miracles still happen, and in the next few moments, Sam Luke will share practical insights into knowing the God of miracles. Join Sam and the Victory Tabernacle Church family as we encounter a God who makes miracles still happen. Hello, Pastor Sam here, and I have an exciting message today I call Jesus is Precious. He is the answer to all of life's perplexing questions and the solution to every problem. Let's go into that service right now where I'm speaking on the subject, Jesus is Precious. 1 Peter 2, 7, turn me in your Bible, 1 Peter 2 and 7. Just a very short verse of Scripture, and I want to uh, just read the first part of it. Peter said, Therefore to you who believe... He, or Jesus, is precious. The word precious expresses closeness, endearment, and affection. To say someone is precious is to say that they are highly prized and valued. Peter used this word precious six times in the two short epistles that he authored. And when he wrote these words, it was 30 years after he had first met the Lord by the Sea of Galilee. He had been in prison. He had suffered for the gospel, but he found that his experience in Jesus Christ was meaningful to his heart. After all those years, Peter sat down and he dipped his quill into the inkwell, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he revealed the deepest feelings of his heart. And he said, Therefore, to those of us who believe, Jesus is precious. I mean, why shouldn't he say Jesus is precious? Because Jesus had not only saved him, but he had restored him. This morning, I'm talking to people that have been born again. I'm talking to people that have been saved by the grace of God. But I'm also talking to people who know what it is to fail God. Sometimes I think that we pretend that we've never failed. Sometimes we pretend that since the moment... We ask Christ to come into our hearts that we've never let him down in any way. And that's not the case, is it? How many of you know what it is for God to restore you? Amen. Aren't you glad he's merciful? Yes. Aren't you glad he's long-suffering? Yes. Peter was a dynamic disciple. He was one of these disciples who was a type A personality. There are just a few of us around today. I wish we could all wear some kind of a name tag so we'd know who we're talking to. You know what I'm talking about. The kind of person that's passionate. The kind of person that always expresses deep emotions about everything. I'm one of those people. I can't help it. That's who I am. I'll own it. I'm the kind of person that goes into a new restaurant and they serve him a glass of water and he says, My, this is the best water I've had all day. Things that happen to us make a mark on us. We're impressed by things. We appreciate things. Well, Peter was one of those people. When he followed the Lord, he followed him with his whole heart. He was passionate about serving Jesus. Jesus called him into the ministry by performing a miracle. Peter was a fisherman, and Jesus sunk his boat with fish. The net broke. And by the way, I think there's an interesting story, and I won't go uh, into it because, in detail anyway because it takes too long. But the Lord asked to use Simon Peter's boat to preach. I don't know how far out from the shore he went, but as he preached, his voice was amplified by the water, and the people heard him. And then as a reward, he said, Now, let me show you where the fish are. And he said, you're not out deep enough. Now, in Peter's day, that's not how they, catch, they, they caught fish. They would catch them by trapping them against the bank. And he said, you need to get out of this shallow water. I'll show you where they are. Peter had been washing his nets, plural. He was washing nets because he was frustrated. He had been fishing all night and he'd caught nothing. Why would you wash nets that had never been used? 
And in frustration, he's washing his nets when Jesus said, cast out into the deep. But it says that the net broke. So in other words, the nets that he had washed and had used all night were cast into the bow of the boat. And no doubt, Peter just took an old rotten net and threw it in the water and said, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about because he's not a fisherman. He's a carpenter. What does he know about fishing? Little did he know that he was talking to the universe, uh, the, the, the master of the universe, the ultimate authority in the universe. Little did he know that he was talking to the one that stood on nothing and said, let there be. Little did he know that he was talking to the one who laid the foundations of the earth and stretched the line upon it to determine the measurements thereof, who shut in the sea with doors and made the clouds its garment and commanded the morning and made the dawn to know its place. Little did he know that he was talking to the one of whom it said all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. If anybody knew where the fish were located, Jesus was the fish finder. And he said, now cast your nets, plural, out. But what did Simon Peter do? He cast out his net. And the net began to break. And over 150 fish were in that net. And this man who was vile, this man who was a, a hyperactive, A-D-D-D-D-D-D-D-D-D-D-D personality, suddenly felt the need to fall on his knees before the Lord and say, you are the Messiah. And he followed the Lord with all of his heart. Well, the miracle of multiplication when Jesus fed the hungry multitude took place in the hands of the disciples. That means that Peter saw fish grow in his hands and, and little breadcrumbs turn into bread rolls and he fed the hungry multitude. He was right there with Jesus. It was, it was Peter that identified Jesus as the son of the living God. It was Peter that said at the Last Supper, I will never deny you. The rest of these little half-sissy preachers might, but not me, Jesus. Do you remember me? You call me Rocky. That's my nickname. I'm not about to quit. I'm a fighter. I won't give up. The rest of these guys may quit, but not me. Jesus said, well, you're going to deny me three times before morning. And I believe that Peter probably whispered under his breath, that's what you think. Because I went to town and bought a sword. And so when they came to get Jesus, Peter was the only one that stepped out in front of him and said, Jesus is precious to me. You're not taking him. And he pulled out a sword and cut off the high priest's nephew's ear. Now, I don't think that that speaks well of his ability as a swordsman. You know, it would have said something if the scripture said Peter cut his head off, but he cut his ear off. He was trying to cut his head off, but he succeeded in cutting his ear off, and Jesus took the ear, <sighs> slapped it back on his head, and it stayed there. Right? So now he doesn't know what to do because Jesus said, put up your sword. I told you you don't need a sword. They that live by the sword die by the sword. And Jesus was led away. Now watch this. Peter was the only one that followed. The rest of them were scattered. Now he's still trying to be true. He's passionate, but he's following afar. Off. And maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you're still in the church, but maybe you're following afar. Off. Maybe you still have a relationship with the Lord, but it's not what it used to be, and it's not what it should be. And it's not what it ought to be, and it's not what it could be. So he's following the Lord afar off, and the Lord is where he can see him. And Peter is warming by a coal of fires, and a little woman says, you're a disciple of Christ, and he panics. And he says, if I, if I tell her I'm a disciple, they might just take me and crucify me. And he said, no, I don't know him. And he thought, well, that's okay. Nobody's watching. Nobody's looking. You know what character is? Character is who you are when nobody's watching. I don't know him. And she said, well, I don't believe that. You sound just like him. He's from Galilee, and so are you. You have a northern accent. I don't know him. And then she said, ah, wait a minute. You know, I saw you. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Guess who was in your group? I was. 
I saw your face. You're one of his disciples. And he swore and cursed. He said, hey, like that. Because people that follow the Lord don't talk that way. I don't know him. And about that time, the rooster said, ah, 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 ah. I'm getting good at that. <laughs> and Jesus looked at him and his eyes pierced his soul. And he said, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, sometimes we feel like we have disqualified ourselves for ministry. But I want to encourage you and tell you that the Lord never did call the qualified. He only qualifies the called. Peter said, what I did has caused me to lose my ministry. I am no longer a disciple of Jesus. I guess I'll just go back to doing what I used to do before I met the Lord. If you're, oh, if you're back where you used to be before you met the Lord, you're backslidden. Hello, if you went back to what you used to do and who you used to be, you're backslidden. But don't despair, there's hope. An angel of the Lord appeared to the women after Jesus' resurrection and told them to go preach something to the disciples. I'm sorry, but I believe in women preachers. I know one woman that carried the word for nine months. Her name was Mary. Somebody said, well, it says be silent in the church. Well, if you'd study that, you know what it says? It says because the women couldn't read and they didn't understand anything, they were calling out to their husbands in the church. And he said, listen, ask your husband at home. Don't call out in the middle of a worship service. Hey, Freddie, what does that mean? That's all he's saying. I mean, come on, folks. Well, women ought to keep silent. If you read the epistles, you'll find time and time again where the apostles talked about people that assisted them in the ministry who were co-laborers who were women. Hello? And so God gave a message to the women to go back and deliver to the disciples. And they said, we just heard from an angel of the Lord, Jesus is risen, and he told you to go back to where you first met him and said to tell his disciples and Peter because he thought he had been left out. And Peter showed up and the Lord gloriously restored him and said, feed my sheep. Now fast forward to the day of Pentecost. Who's standing up with the 11 on the day of Pentecost? Who preached that soul-stirring message that resulted in the conversion of 3,000 souls? It was Simon Peter. Hallelujah. Listen, you can color with a broken crayon. It still works. Amen? And some of you think that because you messed up and you failed, you stumbled, you skinned your knee, I'll just quit. I'll give up. There's no reason for me to go back to church. There's no reason for me to do what I used to do. Don't stop. It is not over until God says it's over. Who told you God wasn't going to use you? So no wonder after 30 years, he said he's still precious. He's precious to me and he's precious to everyone who believes? I want to ask you, is Jesus precious to you today? Are you a believer? Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know what faith is? Faith is that woman with the issue of blood. She had leukemia, and she said, If I can reach out and touch his garment, the hem of his garment, by faith I'll be made whole. And healing virtue began to flow into her, and Jesus turned to her and says, Your faith has made you whole. You know what? faith is? It's when a man with palsy says, I can't get up and walk to Jesus, but I know where he is. He's in that house. And if you, my friends, will carry me over there and get up on top of that house and rip the roof tiles off and let me down, I'll get healed. And Jesus said, hey, rise up and walk. Glory to God. Faith is a blind man that meets Jesus and Jesus spits on the ground and makes clay and puts it in his eyes and tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. You tell that to some people. They say, oh, gross. Jesus spit in a man's eye. I say, spit on me, Jesus. Come on. Amen. 
That's the DNA of God, if you please. Can you imagine having the DNA of God in your eyes? Those blind eyes had to be healed. Hallelujah. And I see this man stumbling through the street. Hey, which way to the pool of Siloam? Go on down there, blind man. When you hit that brick wall, turn right. It's just over to your right. Thank you very much. Bang. Oh, here we go. Amen. And he washed his eyes in the pool, and he came back saying, I was blind, but now I can see. That's faith. That's faith. <laughs> hey, y'all got a minute? Okay, I want you to put on your thinking cap. That's what they used to tell us in the fifth grade. Remember that? Put on your thinking cap. Think with me. Think with me. God is God all by himself. Somebody said, where did God come from? All right. I'm going to tell you. Now, which God are we talking about? Are we talking about the God you made up in your mind? Or are we talking about God Almighty? Now, let's, let's figure out which one we're talking about. Because if you're talking about the one in the Bible that's revealed in the Bible, now watch, he exists outside of time, space, and matter. And all three of those things had to be created simultaneously. Did you know that? See, we live in a world where time, space, and matter make up our world. That's who we are. In Genesis 1 and 1, it says, and in the beginning, that's time. God created that space. And that's matter. So a God who exists out time, outside of time, space, and matter created something, but he didn't leave it alone for it to wind down like an alarm clock would. What he did is he said, I'm going to uphold it and sustain it with the word of my power. I'm going to make sure everything just continues because I said, let there be. I never did say, let there not be. So I'm going to maintain it all. And the way my people will exist in that realm of time, space, and matter is by faith. So three times, four times in the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, it said that the just shall walk by faith and live by faith. You say, no, wait a minute, hold on. You don't understand. I've been to the university. I know who I am. I'm just a, I, I'm just a product of billions of years of evolution. My mind is a computer. That's all it is. This body of mine, it's a result of evolution. It, it, you don't understand. Faith has nothing to do with it. All right, then explain to me the emotions of love, hate, and reason. That's not something you can put under a microscope, is it? So there must be something spiritual and something invisible that impacts the realm of the natural. Woo, I'm about to preach some right now. David looked out one time over the Mediterranean Sea and he saw a water spout. That's a tornado on the water. And he looked at it and he watched it. And he said to himself, there's a reason why that was created out there. And even though he lived a long time ago, he understood the tides. Do you know why we have a high tide and a low tide? Somebody said, that man has lost his mind. I can't follow him. Where's he going now? Stay with me. Do you know why we have a high tide and a low tide? It's because of the pull of the moon on the earth. See, something way out there, 280,000 miles away, is pulling on the earth, and it causes the tide to rush in, to rise, and to rest. Ooh, come on, Pastor Sam. I think I know where you're going. What David said is deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spout. Something way out there in the universe has affected something way down deep, two miles deep down at the bottom of the sea. And it caused a water spout. It caused something to impact the physical realm, the natural realm. It's spiritual. It's invisible. But somehow I see a manifestation of it in the natural realm. I've come by to let you know that I am not just a product of billions of years of evolution. 
creation. I was created in the image of God who exists outside of time and space and matter and something way out there has affected something way down in here. Hallelujah. And I'm walking by faith. I said I'm walking by faith. Ooh, I'm preaching better than you letting on. I'm preaching better than I'm letting on. I'm trying to keep it on the down low. Amen. What is the source of your faith? It's the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. The word is God's voice to our lives. If you want faith, read the word of God. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words of silver, tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Isaiah 55, 10, 11, For as the rain cometh down, the snow from heaven returneth not thither, but water theareth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud that it maketh seed to the sore, and bread that either. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Your faith comes from the word. It is derived by the word. It is produced by the word. And when you confess the word of God, that's how you release your faith. Amen. Oh, Jesus is precious to those who believe. And the kind of faith that we have is faith that believes, faith that receives, and faith that achieves. Somebody say amen. amen. So there are three reasons why Jesus is precious. I want everybody to say that with me. Jesus is precious. Say it again. Jesus is precious. Say it again. Jesus is precious. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Jesus is precious. Jesus is precious. There's a connection between your faith and the value of Christ. Because you believe, because you believe, because you are a believer, you can say Jesus is precious. There's a connection between what you believe and what you say. Sometimes you've got to say it to see it, right? How many of you ever said, now don't raise your hand. These kids are driving me crazy. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many of you ever said, this job is killing me. And then when you have a problem, my aching back, you have already convinced yourself to be miserable. Right. Why not today and every day after today? Whenever you are in a crisis situation, whenever you are tempted to throw in the towel, whenever you feel like you want to raise up your hands and shout, I quit, why don't you just say, Jesus is precious. Try it one more time. Everybody shout, Jesus is precious. Shout, Jesus is precious. Shout, Jesus is precious. Now, now, before I tell you, and there are three things I'm going to tell you. Before I tell you these three things, can I tell you something that's an honest observation? Here's my, here's my observation where, for whatever it's worth. Is that somehow we have in this postmodern church come to a place where we don't really even want to talk about Jesus except as it relates to his blessings. You can preach a sermon, a masterful sermon on Jesus, and people will sit there and just look at you. But if I say Jesus wants to make you rich, what? Say that again. Jesus wants to give you a new car. What? Jesus won't. I'm not going to go there. And it's like, oh, now you got my attention. Oh, I want to be healed. Do you? Well, let me tell you what. If you want to be healed, the healer is precious. Amen. And his name is Jesus. I want to be blessed. Well, the blesser is Jesus, and he's precious. Yeah. Well, I, I want to be delivered. Well, the deliverer is Jesus. And no longer is Jesus precious to us, but it's that thing and that blessing that he brings. I've been blessed beyond measure, but I can tell you this morning that if I never get one other thing from God than what I already got, Jesus is precious. 
He's precious to me. Hallelujah. 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 Are, are, are you ready? Can you, can, have you got a few more minutes? Okay. There are three things. First thing is this. Jesus is precious because of who he is. He's the son of God. Today, a Muslim prays these words. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet. And he prays that five times a day. He gives to beggars and keeps the fast, makes a pilgrims to Mecca. The Hindu observes the rules of the caste. He worships a monkey and a cow. He'll crawl on his belly like a worm to a temple bath in the filthy Ganges River where he wrecks a temple to one of the well, millions, literally millions of unknowable, transcendent, impersonal gods. And you know what he hopes to do? Escape rebirth as a reptile or a woman. The Confucianist studies the sacred classics and learns the rules of righteousness, but in the end he must save himself. He can follow the path of duty, but that path ends at the grave. Hindu, Buddhist, Confucianist, the Muslim, all those world religions talk about things that you can do to be religious, and most of them will challenge you to lay your life down for your religion, but as far as I know, Christianity is the only religion where God died for man. You know, the Muslim says the greatest honor is to die in a jihad. I could die for Allah. It would be wonderful not just be admitted uh, entrance to, to paradise. But God says the greatest thing I could ever do is die for you. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Remember it was this same Peter that wrote Jesus is precious who asked Jesus, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to love God. And then after the lesson was over, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter said, I don't know what everybody else is saying, but this is what I know. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen. The Bible says in John, the 20th chapter, verse 31, and this is one of the last things that John wrote. He said, but these were written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have a life through his name. John the Baptist said in, uh, that I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Paul writing in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 he said that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness or Holy Spirit by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus is precious because he is the Son of God. Fully God and fully man. Galatians chapter 4 beginning verse 4. But in the fullness of the time God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou no more servant but a son? And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. If you are a child of God, you've been born again, you've passed from death unto life, you know you have a new nature, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, would you give God your best praise right now? I mean, are you saying Jesus is precious? Are you saying Jesus is precious? I thought so. My prayer is that the Lord of glory will come to live in your heart by faith today. For more information about this church and the ministries of this church, go to our website, victorytab.org, or call us at 804-744-8881 for your free gift God bless you. And until we're together again, like this around the Word of God, this is Pastor Sam reminding you that here at Victory Tabernacle, faith brings a victory and miracles still happen. 